بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم <تصفيق> الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله وعلى أهل بيتك الطيبين الطاهرين المظلومين سيما الإمام المبين والكهف الحصين وغياث المضطر المستكين مولانا وسيدنا وولي أمرنا الحجة ابن الحسن فداه أرواح العالمين صلى الله عليك يا أبا عبد الله صلى الله عليك وعلى أصحابك المستشهدين بين يديك ورحمة الله وبركاته Please recite a loud salawat First of all, I want to have a word with the youth that are present in this majlis. You should be very grateful and very thankful to the Almighty God for giving you this opportunity once again to attend these majlis and maintain your relationship with Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. Imam al Hussein is the ultimate link between us and God. If you strengthen your relationship with God, with Imam al Hussein, you strengthen your bond with God. And if your relationship with Imam al Hussein is weak, then your relationship with God will weaken. Because Imam al Hussein is the ultimate link between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Through Imam al Hussein, we get to know God. Through Imam al Hussein, we get to know the Prophet. Through Imam al Hussein, we get to know our religion. This is why, brothers and sisters, it is wrong to think that Imam al Hussein is confined to the first 10 days of Muharram. We need Imam al Hussein every single day. And this is why we are encouraged to pray on the soil of Karbala five times a day. Imam al Sadiq, he never prayed on any soil other than the soil of Karbala. Not just that. Every time you drink water, Imam al Hussein was deprived from water, right? And water is an essential component of life. So one of the reasons why this happened is so every time you want to drink water, we are encouraged to remember Imam al Hussein, alayhi salam, and we are encouraged to recite the ziyarah to visit Imam al Hussein every single day. And these are not my words; these are the words of Imam al Sadiq, alayhi salam. When he taught one of his companions to recite Ziyarat Ashura, he tells the man that if you can recite this Ziyarat every single day. So it's not exclusive to the day of Ashura. If you can recite the Ziyarat every single day, do so. So you have to be very thankful that you've maintained this relationship. Some people, their religion is exclusive to the first 10 days of Muharram. Their religiosity is a seasonal 
religious religiosity. What these people fail to realize is the fact that the first 10 days of Muharram is the catalyst. You establish the link on the day of Ashura in the first 10 days of Muharram, but afterwards, after establishing that link, you should send and receive data and you should maintain this relationship with Imam al Hussein. And your presence today is highly commendable. Especially given that you are under immense pressure and you have survived all the attempts to derail you from this path and to distance you from Imam al Hussein. I mean, if you choose not to attend these programs, you have plenty of things to do at home. You could easily spend, out, spend hours on video games playing Fortnite Battle Royale for three, four, five hours without feeling the boredom or feeling tired or even the need to use the bathroom. Or you could use these social networking apps for several hours while when you come to this majlis and try to stay focused and attentive for one whole hour sometimes it's so boring I mean sometimes I feel that we are competing we as public speakers competing with large corporations and companies who try to captivate your heart and captivate your mind I mean, the attention span of our youth today is so short. When you see a clip, even if the, if the clip is so captivating, so interactive, but if you're not interested in the clip, you see it for three seconds and then you go to the next post or go to the next video. Let alone coming to this place and stay focused for one whole hour. So it's so difficult. This is why what you chose to do today by attending these majalis is highly commendable because brothers and sisters if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees you not interested in Imam al Hussein, not interested in his message not inter interested in God not interested in Salat not interested in Shi'ism Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't need us Imam al Hussein doesn't need us so God could easily remove your name from the list of the lovers of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. And next thing you know, you're not in mood to come to the majlis. When you want to pray, you're not in that spiritual state that would enable you to stay focused. The passion, the love will be removed from your heart. This is why Imam Zayl Abideen in the famous supplication in Dua Abu Hamza, he says, Sayyidi, la'allaka an babika taratani. Oh God, did you kick me out of your, of your kingdom? Oh, la'allaka ra'aytani alifa majalis al-battalin fa bayni wa baynahum khallaytani. Or that you saw me, I'm more interested in spending time on things that are useless. Yes. I am willing to spend hours on socializing with people that don't benefit me rather than spending two minutes on Salat or on Ibadah. This is why the Imam says that, Oh God, when you saw me that I'm interested in doing things that don't benefit me and you saw my lack of interest in the things that matter to me, you left me. You don't want to come to the majlis, fine, I'll remove the love of Imam al Hussein from your heart, your heart. And this is dangerous, brothers and sisters. But this can happen to us. Because God doesn't need us. Imam al Hussein doesn't need us. We are the ones that are in need of Imam al Hussein. We are the ones that are in need of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His guidance. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not to separate between us and our Mawla and our master Imam al Hussein, Not just us, but even our children, and the children of our children, and our lineage, until the day of judgment with the blessing of allowed salawat. The number 40 has some religious significance. 
It's not a random number according to our religion. But this is not exclusive to our religion. It's also significant to every other divine religion. In fact, in the scriptures of all Abrahamic religions, there have been repeated uh, mentions of this number. In the Old Testament, the number 40 was repeated 70 times. In the New Testament, many times. In total, 159 times in the New and Old Testament. And in fact, every prominent prophet that we know of had something to do with the number with the number 40. But this lecture tonight is not just about this number. If you listen carefully to this lecture, you will benefit and you will listen to some beneficial tips, practical lessons that you can take from this lecture tonight. So let's start with Prophet Adam السلام, the first prophet of God. As you all know, Initially, Prophet Adam was created in paradise. But narrations tell us that the paradise that he was dwelling in is different from the ultimate paradise that the good people will go to after the Day of Judgment. He was able to do whatever he wanted to do. Everything was permissible for him to do except for eating from the forbidden fruit. When he ate from the forbidden fruit, of course, according to the verse in the Quran, from the very start, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted Adam to be in this earth. But he had to go through that process. So he goes to paradise, he eats from the forbidden fruit, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings him to this earth. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings him to this earth, we don't know how it was his lifestyle in paradise. What we do know, however, is that when he was brought down to this earth, he was so regretful, he was so remorseful, because he was kicked out of God's kingdom because of the mistake that he committed. It wasn't a sin, but it was a mistake that he committed. This is why he was so regretful and he was so remorseful that he cried not for a day or two or a year or two, but for decades. For decades he did not stop crying. Now imagine if you're a multi-billionaire, and I'm, and I'm pretty sure you've seen some of the pictures and posts of the multi-billionaires and their accounts on Instagram and on Facebook, and how they boast and brag about their wealth and the cars that they drive, and the yachts and jets that they own, and the palaces that they live in, and generally their lifestyle. Imagine if a multi-billionaire suddenly loses all his wealth. Everything that he has, he loses everything overnight. How would that person feel if he turns into a peasant after he was a multi-billionaire? Such a person would be remorseful, would be regretful for a year, two, three. It takes time for them to adapt to the new lifestyle. But with Adam, he cried and wept and was remorseful for 40 consecutive years. According to our narrations, because of the tears that continuously flow, flowed from his eyes, these tears created marks and a scar on his cheeks. When you are bereaved, when you are struck with a tragedy, you would cry for a year or two when you lose a loved one. But eventually your tears will dry up. But with Adam, he had all the motive to cry for 40 years consecutively. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala separated between him and his beloved wife, Hawa. Hawa was the most beautiful creature that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ever created. To an extent, narrations tell us that the beauty of Yusuf alayhi salam, he was known for his, his beauty. His beauty was only a small portion of Hawa's beauty. 
our mother. Not only that, Hawa was tailor-made for Adam. When we marry our spouse, usually our spouse, we have a lot of... The issues stem from the fact that sometimes we're not compatible with each other. They come from a different culture, they come from a different background, they have different tastes. But with Hawa, he was tailor-made for Adam salam. All of a sudden, because of what he did in paradise, Allah separated between him and Hawa for 40 years. Only 40 years later, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught him how to repent. He repented, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted his repentance, and he reunited him with his wife. So this story has a lot of details, but the highlight of the story, something relevant to this topic, is the fact that he cried and suffered for 40 years. After Adam, fifth, the fifth generation after Adam, we all know that Adam had two sons, Habil and Qabil. Habil was killed by Qabil. But he also has another son called Sheath. And he was the successor of Adam. He was the standard bearer of God's message after the demise of his father Adam. And the reason why Qabil killed his brother Habil was because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted his sacrifice and selected him to succeed his father. Out of jealousy, his brother Qabil killed him. But the religion of God needs to continue. His legacy needs to continue. This is why he chose his other son, their younger brother, Prophet Sheath. And his name is mentioned in Ziyarat al Nahiya for the brothers that intend to go to Karbala. Make sure that you recite this diara when you go to the shrine of Imam al Hussein and try to understand the words and the meanings of the ziyara, of the words in the ziyara. Not his grandchild or his grand grandchild, the grand grand grandchild of Adam is Prophet Noah, the fifth generation after Prophet. Adam. We all know that Prophet Nuh السلام, he preached and he tried to convince his people and guide him to the right path for 950 years according to the Quran. According to the Quran, he used to give four speeches every single day. One in the morning, one in the evening, one in public and one in private, trying to reason with his people. And as a public speaker, I know how difficult it is to give a single speech, let alone four speeches every single day for 950 years. To people that were not appreciative, they were not respectful. They would sometimes, when they get bored of his speeches, they would bash him up. Alhamdulillah, the community here don't bash up their speaker. Or do you? Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad I think I need a bodyguard from now on <coughs> I'm sure I'm in good hands <laughs> Anyway So they would beat him up And leave him unconscious for three days According to our narrations And the reason why his name is not Nuh, his name is Abdul A'la. But the reason why he is called Nuh is because he used to cry, he used to, he used to sob a lot. Why? Because he was so concerned about the people's fate. Because he knew that these sins that these people commit will have consequences. When they commit adultery, this will have consequences. When they eat haram food, this will have consequences. And he treated the people in his community like his children. This is why he was so concerned about their fate. He would try to convince them, to persuade them, to embrace guidance, but they wouldn't budge. So he preached for 300 years, according to our narrations. Then, he chose to ask God to bring down his wrath, to punish his nation, after 300 years. While he was walking to go to the Holy Land, to the place where he wanted to make that prayer, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends a group of angels. They go to meet with Nuh. 
and they convince him, they tell him that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to postpone this prayer, to delay it, and give them another chance, and wait another 300 years. Just give them another chance. He accepts, he goes back. And then he, you know, tries to persuade them, speaks to them, gives lectures day and night. 300 years later, he decides to make that prayer. And you know, with these apostles and these prophets, when they pray to God, their prayer is accepted. As he was about to go and make that prayer, Allah sends another group of angels to tell him to postpone and delay his prayer and give them another chance and wait another 300 years. So 900 years in total. After 900 years, he goes to make that prayer, the angels come and they tell him that when you make the prayer, God will answer your prayer. This time, God will answer your prayer. They encourage him to make that prayer. But beforehand, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to exempt all the children. Because the children should not be involved in God's punishment. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, beforehand, He makes all the men impotent. He takes away their ability to make women pregnant. And He makes all the women barren. They can't become pregnant and conceive children. Until all the children grow up, now they're adults, and they fail to heed to the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah gives him a sign. He says, when you see the water coming out of the, uh, of the furnace, this is a sign that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has uh, brought down his punishment on your nation. So 950 years later, while his wife is about to bake bread, they see the water coming out of, of the furnace. The flood starts for 40 consecutive days and nights. The earth, water would sprout from the earth and the sky is showering the, the earth with rain for 40 consecutive days and nights until the earth was cleansed and he wiped out humanity except for those that boarded the ark of Nuh alayhi salam. Then we go to Musa alayhi salam because his story is mentioned in the Quran. Again, a lot of details, but what's relevant to the topic is the fact that Musa alayhi salam was still young, but he had to run away from Pharaoh and from the Egyptians. So he goes to Madian, he marries the daughter of Shu'aib. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, فَلَمَّا بَلَغَ أَشُدَّهُ وَاسْتَوَىٰ آتَيْنَاهُ حُكْمًا وَعِلْمًا Narrations tell us that he reached the age of 40. When he was 40, he reached, he reached that level of maturity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him wisdom and gave him authority. But only 40 years after reaching that level of maturity, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided to drown Pharaoh and his cohorts. Jibra'il in a hadith says that I spoke to God. I said to him that Pharaoh is claiming to be the Lord of the Lords and you're not doing anything to him. God said we'll give him a chance. He might repent, he might come back and return to his, his senses. So 40 years later, Musa was young when he left his people. He comes back 40 years later. And then he gives them another 40 years to give Pharaoh and his people another chance until the mass exodus happens and he drowns in the Nile or in the Red Sea. Then, after he saves the Israelites, one day he tells them that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants me to receive his revelation. So I'm going to be away for 30 days. This 30 days is extended with another 10 days. So in total it was 40 days. In a verse in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that from the beginning it was supposed to be 40 days. This is why in the New Testament and the Old Testament, the word 40 or the number 40 symbolizes the period of probation and trial and testing. They needed this extra 10 days to be tested, to be trialed.
So he comes back and the rest is history. He sees them worshipping the calf. Then Musa tells them that I have orders from God that you should go to the Holy Land and fight your enemies. But they fail to listen to God's orders. When they fail to listen to God's orders, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, then you shall wander in the deserts and get lost for 40 years. Only 40 years later, the legit legitimate successor of Musa alayhi salam, a man by the name of Joshua, Yusha ibn Nun, who was appointed by Musa to succeed him, but unfortunately another man came after the death of Musa, he usurped the Khilafah, he became the first caliph, and then you had another man usurp the Khilafah after the death of the first man, and then you have a third person usurping the Khilafah, that position, and then only after three people that Joshua becomes the, assumes power, and he was the legitimate Khalifa of Musa alayhi salam. So he leads the Israelites and he conquers the Holy Land and they settle there. That's Musa alayhi salam. With our Prophet, although he was a Prophet from day one, the narration tell us, كُنْتُ آدَمْ كُنْتُ نَبِيًّا وَآدَمْ مُنْجَدِلٌ بَيْنَ الْمَاءِ والطين. I was a prophet when Adam was still between clay and water. However, he officially received the revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The proclamation happened when he turned 40. Now the common grounds between all these prophets and all these examples is the fact that they had to do something with the number 40. Because the number 40 resemble the completion of a cycle. Prophet Adam had to suffer for 40 years to pay the price of the sin that he committed. Prophet Nuh needed 40 days and nights to cleanse the earth. Prophet Musa السلام, needed to be 40 to reach that level of maturity. And the Prophet says about himself, our Prophet, he says that Adabani Rabbi, God disciplined me, he raised me for 40 years before telling the people to accept everything that the Prophet gives them. Everything that he gives you, everything that he tells you, take from him, embrace, accept. And everything that he forbids you from doing, stay away from. It took 40 years for God to discipline the Prophet before issuing this order as mentioned in the Quran. Now we go to some other relevant examples. There's a hadith that says, when you reach the age of 40, we all know we have two angels that write down everything that we do and say. Some people think that these angels, the right one is on the right shoulder and the left one is on the left sh shoulder. But according to our narrations, the right one is on the lower right hand side of our lip and the left angel is on the lower left hand side of the lip these are the two hafala the two angels that write down everything as mentioned in the quran ma yalfaw min qawlin illa ladayhi raqibun atid idh yatalaqqa al mutalaqqiyan an al yamin everything that you do everything that you say they write it down. Now when we turn 40, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to these angels and He tells them not to show any leniency anymore. You've had your chance, you've matured enough to understand, and your desires are not as wild as they were when you were young. From now on, everything shall be written down. Because before that, the angels the narrations tell us that if you if you do, if you intend to do a good deed the angel on the left side will tell the angel on the right, right side to write it down before even carrying it out before even doing it just the intention is enough the angel on the left side will tell the angel on the right side write it down before he changes his mind as if you've actually 
carried out the good deed. While if you commit a sin, the angel on the right side, who's supposed, who, who, who's, who's supposed to write the, the good things, will speak to the one on the left side, tell him, and will tell him not to write down the sin. Wait for seven hours, maybe he'll repent. If he repents, don't even write down the sin. This is why there is a, there is a, a, a devil, one of the soldiers of, of shaitan, is called the procrastinator. He would come and tell you, look, don't repent now, because you might want to repeat the sin again. Until this seven hours lapses, and then the sin is written down. But when you turn 40, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells these angels, write down everything that he does. Don't show any leniency anymore. There's another hadith that says, if a person leads a playful life, a desireful life for 40 years, transgressing every boundary, committing every sin in the book, dismissive of all God's injunctions, the shaitan would come and wipe his hands on your face and say, welcome to a face that will never succeed in life. Why? Why? Because you will develop habits that you won't be able to break free from. For 40 years, if you're totally dismissive of God's orders, this will happen to you. Another example, the hadith says that if 40 people come together, sit down to pray to God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will answer their prayer. If you have someone who is sick, who is ill, narrations tell us that 40 people can gather in one place and do a dua, make a prayer. God will answer their prayer. The hadith then says that if you can't get the numbers, then get 10 people to sit together and pray four times. 10 people to pray four times. So 40 prayers all together. Allah will answer their prayer. If you can't get 10 people to sit together and make the prayer, get four people to sit together and pray 10 times each. Make it 40 prayers. Or if you can't get 40 people, if you're alone, then pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 40 times, Allah will answer your prayer. And there's another hadith that says that if you, before you do the dua, if you, before you make the prayer, if you pray for 40 mu'min, as some people do in Salatul Layl, in the nightly vigil, if you pray for 40 people, mention them by names, you mention them, mention your friends, your relatives, and then you pray for yourself. The hadith says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will answer your prayer regarding yourself and answer your prayer regarding your friends and relatives and the mu'mineen that you mentioned. Another hadith says that when a person dies and 40 mu'min come, and that's customary, when someone dies, we usually mention this in Salatul Janazah, one of the things that we do is, is say, Allahumma inna la na'lamu minhu illa khaira. Oh God, we don't know about his sins. We only know about his good deeds. The hadith says that a 40 faithful person say the statement after a person's death, Allah will say, I will accept your testimony and forgive the sins that you're not aware of. I am aware of his sins, but because of your testimony, I will forgive all your sins, all his sins. Another hadith with respect to the number 40 says that if you learn, if you memorize by heart 40 narration, 40 hadith, 40 of the Prophet's sayings or the sayings of the Ahlul Bayt with respect to with respect to your religion on the day of judgment the Prophet himself will intercede for you and you will never be punished on the day of judgment if you memorize 40 of the Prophet's sayings or the sayings of the Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam Now we come to Karbala. When you look at the story of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam what you realize is that the story would be incomplete. The mission would be incomplete without the aftermath of Ashura, without the role of Lady Zainab alayhi salam Incidentally, they were paraded from one city to another. They were taken to 40 cities. Four, zero. Their intention was to humiliate them. Their intention was to tell 
the masses that they have become victorious and they managed to defeat Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. But look at how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turns the tables. Look at how their aim to destroy Imam al Hussein turned in the favor of Imam al Hussein in favor of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. Everywhere they went, Lady Zainab propagated the message of Imam al-Hussein and spoke to the people about the tragedy of Imam al-Hussein and who Imam al-Hussein was. So without the story, without the role of Lady Zainab, the whole mission would be incomplete. Her role with respect to Karbala was like the role of her mother Fatima al-Zahra with respect to Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. If it wasn't for Fatima al-Zahra, Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen's mission would have been incomplete after the death of the Prophet and for 40 consecutive nights, again 4-0 she would go in the middle of the night with Amir al-Mu'mineen to knock on the doors of the Muhajireen and Ansar and ask them for their support to support Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam So Lady Zainab's role was she played a pivotal role it was instrumental she had to go to these different cities and she had to give a speech in the assembly of Ibn Ziyad and she had to give a speech in the assembly of Yazid Ibn Muawiyah and change the people's perception the wrong erroneous perception that the people had towards Imam al Hussein, just through one lecture and then come back to Karbala and pave the way Pave the way, giving access to the people to come to the ziyara and creating this tradition. The tradition of visiting Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. And that's what completed this mission. The mission was accomplished when Lady Zainab returned to Karbala. This is why a scholar by the name of Buhlul, some people think that he was a crazy person, but he wasn't. He was a loyal lover of the Ahlul Bayt but he pretended to be crazy, to run away from responsibilities being imposed by the Caliph of the time, Harun al-Abbasi. So this guy, he goes to Mecca to perform Hajj. After circumambulating around the Kaaba, performing Hajj, he said, God, I'm really thankful to you for creating me, for giving me guidance, and for all the blessings that you gave me. But God, let me tell you one thing. Don't forget to appreciate the efforts that were made by your Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He suffered a lot. His own tribe, his own nation, they rejected him. They verbally abused him, they physically abused him, they attacked him, they threw pebbles, impurities on him, they broke his forehead. Narrations tell us that when he fell in the battle of Uhud, Archangel Gabriel comes down, he says to him, every prophet has an answerable, if, if he makes a prayer, God will answer his prayer. So you have the chance and the right to invoke God's wrath with one prayer. So the Prophet raises his hands. All the angels are waiting for the Prophet to utter those words that would bring down God's wrath on these people and efface them from the face of earth. He raises his hands and he says, Oh God, I forgive my nation and I want you to forgive them as well. If it's my right to punish them, I forgive them. And I want you to guide them. Allahumma ihdi qawmi fa'innahum la ya'lamun. So God, if it wasn't for these efforts, we wouldn't be Muslims today. We wouldn't say, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. And then he goes to Medina. He travels to Medina to visit the Prophet. After visiting the Prophet, he says, Ya Rasulullah, Jazakallah anna khayr. May God reward you for what you did. But Ya Rasulullah, don't forget Ali's role following your death. He was the one that raised the standard of your religion after your death. And you know what they did to Ali? You know how many wars they waged against your successor, Ya Rasulullah? 
And for 25 years he was placed under house arrest. 25 years. And when he assumed power, the moment he assumed power, they broke their allegiance with him. The people that gave him allegiance. And then they waged several wars until they assassinated him. So don't forget the role of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Then he goes to Najaf. Assalamu alayka ya Abel Hassan. Assalamu alayka ya Amir al Mu'mineen. We got to know God through you. We got to know the Prophet through you. We got to know our religion through you, ya Amir al Mu'mineen. But ya Amir al Mu'mineen, don't forget the role of Hussein, your son. If you and the Prophet initiated this movement, it was Hussein that protected it. It was Hussein that, that safeguarded it. Then he goes to Karbala. Salamu alayka ya Aba Abdullah. Ya Aba Abdullah, you gave the blood of your heart. Wa badala muhjatahu fiq. Muhja is the blood of the heart. Ya Aba Abdullah, you gave your six month old infant. You gave your children, your brothers, your companions. So that we are salvaged. To save us from deviance and from ignorance. But Ya Aba Abdullah, don't forget the role of Zainab. It was Zainab that propagated your message. Otherwise, when you were killed, when you were dismembered, when they decapitated you, they started to beat the drums of victory and rejoice and clap because they thought they finished you they thought that this is the end of Islam if it wasn't for Zainab so they thought of everything the Umayyads to silence Imam al Hussein to silence the Prophet what they failed to to see was the role of Lady Zainab alayha salam Hussein Aram Janam Hussein Ruho Ravanam Hussein Aram Janam Hussein Ruh Ravanam Cheher Ruz Shikastan Cheher Ruz Boridan Cheher Ruz Peye Naq Davidan Cheher Ruz Fakat Ta'ne Va Dushnam Shenidam Cheguyam Cheguyam Cheher Ruz Asarat Cheher Ruz Jesarat Cheher Ruz Gham O Gurbat O Gharat Cheher Ruz Parishani O Hasrat Cheher Ruz Musibat Chebeguyam Cheher Ruz Na Sabri Na Karari Cheher Ruz Na Sabri Na Karari نه یک محرم و یاری ز دیاری به دیاری عجب ناق سواری چه بگویم چه بگویم فقط بود سرت بر سر نیقاری چه بگویم چه روز تباشی و نناله ز خاکستر ز خاکستر و دشنام ز هر بام حواله و از شدت اندوه و با خاطر مجروح جگر گوشه تو کنج خرابه همان آینه فاطمه جا ماند سه ساله چه بگویم چه بگویم چه روز فقط شیون و داغ و غم و درد و فراق و فراق و فراق و فراق و چه بگویم چه بگویم بگویم کدام این گله ها رو غم فاصله ها رو تب و آبله ها رو 
و یا تعنه بی رحم ترین هل هل ها رو و یا مرحمت دم به دم هر مل ها رو چه روز سبوری و سبوری غم و ماتم و دوری و سبوری حسین جانم حسین جانم Let's recite dua and faraj together with one loud voice بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم كن لوليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل وليا وقائدا ودليلا حتى تسكنه وتمتعه فيها برحمتك يا أرحم صل اللهم على محمد وأهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين